Um, yeah, we're just gonna go back, back to the beginning. So I'm the state nervous forester. Um, and uh, one of the many things that I do is to run the state big tree program. Um, essentially um, what it is, is a, a registry of all of the champions of all of our native trees. And we also allow for um, uh, landscape and other type of um, non-native trees. Um, we are phasing out from allowing any um, uh, trees that are classified as being invasive on the list. Um, and I, I write monthly articles about the big trees. Uh, for any of you that might be members of the Maine Woodland Owners Organization, I do have articles almost monthly about specific big trees. Um, and so if you're interested in any of those stories, you can certainly, um, for the price of membership, um, get access to those. Um, and then also we have, um, we occasionally share those stories on our internal listservs um, that come out of the main forest service, the project canopy uh, bulletins, as well as our woods wise bulletins and uh, other um, news uh, information that goes out to the public. Um, so a little bit about the register. Um, it was started in 1967 by then state forester, Austin Wilkins. Um, there's a lot of forestry references in Maine to uh, Austin Wilkins. He was kind of a, a pillar of forestry for, for many decades. Um, and he only just recently passed away. Uh, but he, um, it, following the national movement to document the largest specimen of, of native species um, started a list in Maine. Um, originally, that list uh, only contained roughly 30 trees. Today, we have over 140 different species, and um, a few of those have multiple specimens that are listed as co-champions. I did bring a few copies of the most recent published register. That date is 2020. We're working on putting out a new publication for 2024. Um, and then currently we do have a few trees that are listed on the national registry as well. Uh, the yellow birch that's located in Wayne. Um, we have a beautiful black spruce in Bristol, an eastern white pine in Sumner that has been nominated, not officially listed. And then we have a mountain paper birch, which is a, a, a sub-variety of paper birch that grows in uh, northern New England. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few of these. I uh, certainly don't have time to go into all of them. I tried to focus on trees that are native to Maine, trees that provide um, particular habitat value for, for birds particularly, but also all of our native wildlife um, provide um, pollinator benefits. And then I also tried to highlight a few of them that are just um, champions here locally in York County. Um, <clears throat> so how do we measure the trees? I, I do have a video that's online. I tried to incorporate it. Throwing videos into these presentations almost never works and it wasn't gonna work here, so I, I scrapped it. Um, but this, this gives you some very basic instructions. To calculate the points, you measure around the trunk of the tree at four and a half feet from the base of the tree. Generally, you know, if we're on a flat surface, it, it works that way. Are trees usually on flat surfaces? No. So they have to make it a little bit complicated, but you measure roughly four and a half feet from the base of the tree around in inches. And I have a, a nifty uh, logger tape here, if anybody wants to take a look at it, it actually, uh, cal calibrates pi into the, the measurement. So you can take the circumference or you can take the diameter of the tree. Um, and then you take the height of the tree. I have a, another couple of tools. This is an inclinometer is what it's called. Basically you take an angle to the top of the tree at a known distance and you can use geometry to figure out how tall the tree is. Um, and then you take the crown spread. So you imagine the crown of the tree as an umbrella and you're measuring from the, the drip edge on one side to the drip edge of the other. 
and then perpendicular measurement um, to take an average of the crown because most trees are not really symmetrical. Uh, and then you um, come up with a calculation, a quarter of that crown spread plus the height in feet plus the circumference around the, the trunk in inches, and you come up with a total point value. And what that does is it, it kind of uh, it, it calibrates the numbers for, you know, say you've got a really tall white pine tree, and then you've got a, a, a very thick um, but short pine tree. It, it, it makes it a little bit more fair, so you're not just um, uh, evaluating the tree based on one metric. So I'll, I'll launch right into um, some of the trees on the list and uh, we'll, we'll hold questions, I think, till the end that will probably make it easier. Um, but this is our national champion yellow birch that's located in Wayne. Uh, Wayne is uh, just a little bit west of Augusta. Um, it has a circumference of 240 inches, which is over six feet in diameter, a height of 65 feet, Ground spread of 62 feet for a total point value of 321. Um, and I, I'm going to run through the numbers for each of them because you'll, you'll start to kind of get a sense of, of what that means as far as the size. Um, and let's see here. I'm going to show a couple more pictures. That's me up in the tree. Um, I do have a tendency to climb trees when I go measure them. <laughs> I know, you know, some of them, I know I'm not supposed to. Um, it, a lot of these trees you'll find are in kind of specific, um, unique situations where they've been allowed to gain great size. Um, this one, uh, as you can see, is on, on an old fence line, an old stone fence line. It was used as a demarcator for, uh, you know, between farms, um, and it was left there for that purpose when, you know, much of Maine had been cleared for agriculture. Trees were left as property markers and, and for specific uses, particularly on farms. Um, so that yellow birch had been left there. And as you can see, it's it's in a bit rough shape. It's um, rotting out at the base. It's got those three big main stems um, and it has sustained some storm damage over the years, but it's hanging on. Um, I, I did want to also highlight some of the, the wildlife values of these trees, yellow birch, um, all of our birches um, are known to have, um, they're, they're catkins, the fruit that they produce, those disintegrate slowly um, and they release their seeds as spring approaches. And that provides a vital food source for a lot of um, migratory birds. So they, they are quite, um, quite helpful when birds are in a time of need for other you know food sources um and the birches I, i'm sure you probably have all seen that the yellow bellied sap suckers do like to, to tap the birches and um, go after the sap um a couple more photos of that one in wayne from different angles and with the nominators of the trees i don't nominate any of these myself i try not to um, but I rely on people that are out walking in the woods. A lot of them are foresters. Um, in this case, this um, woman, Kathy, she walks in the woods of Wayne all the time, and she knows where all kinds of big trees are, and she's showed me most of them. <laughs> um, and this one just happened to be a national champion. Um. <sighs> good, good question. Um, so this is another tool. I don't use this typically on the big trees. One, it's not going to get to the center because you can see um, this is it's what's called an increment bore. It drills into the center of the tree and then you pull out the core of the, the stem, you know, essentially the size of a pencil and you can count the tree ring. So it's a way to, you know, find out how old the tree is without cutting it down because um, we don't want to do that, obviously. Um, but most of these trees, as you can see, this one's rotted, probably not going to have a solid core for me to be able to pull out the center and, and see how old it is anyway. Uh, yellow birch are known to be the longest lived of our native birch trees. Um, and what I typically would do in a case like this, and then the next one that I'm going to show you, is rely on the land use history. 
to tell me how old that tree is. We know when that land was cleared. We know, you know, when the stone uh, fence was put in. So we can say that most likely it's in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 years. Um, most cases, that's going to be um, how we're going to be able to tell the age. Um, I, I wanted to show you this one too. It's another yellow birch. Um, many trees that are on the list are, are newer to the list or you know, have changed over my 20 plus years of managing the list. Um, this was the tree that when I took over managing the state's big tree registry in 2000, um, that was also on the national registry. Um, this one's in Deer Isle and it has um, just a fascinating history. Um, but you know, here we go with some comparisons. So this tree is still standing. It's just been beat out by the one that's in Wayne. The one in Wayne is a, a little bit larger. Um, this one has a circumference of 214 inches, uh, 65 feet tall. It has a crown spread of 80, 60. So it's, it's actually got a much more grand canopy than the one in uh, Wayne, but it has only a total point value of 301 because it's not, um, doesn't have quite the circumference. Those three stems. In the on the tree in Wayne really give that tree a, a, a pretty vast circumference. Um, so this one's shy of that tree by about 20 points. The, the history of this one is, is just tremendous, though. It's on an old farm, also. Um, as you can see in that picture there in the foreground, there are um, the, you know more stone fences. Um, but this one particularly is in the middle of a sheep pen. So the stone fence around it has the openings for sheep to go in and then, you know, the, the fence, the wall all around it. Um, and this tree was left for the sheep for shade. And it's still, I mean, it's, it's all grown up around it. There's no more sheep um, on the farm, um, but, but the tree is still standing and still providing this tremendous shade. Um, and I, I just love, um, in the picture on the left hand side, you can see these these branches coming down from the the upper upper branches. Those are actually adventitious roots. So the tree is kind of growing on itself down into the ground. And um, you know, there's all these beautiful spruce trees and all this moss um, down around the base. It's, it's really um, kind of a, a fairy wonderland around that tree. Um, I do try to highlight two trees that are publicly accessible. This tree is on a farm. It's called Yellow Birch Farm. Imagine that. Um, and it's on the Reach Road in Deer Isle. And the farm owners are happy to have visitors. The, the tree is back in the woods along a path, but they, they will happily guide you out there and show you the tree. Um, they don't want a tour bus showing up, but you know, if you and your friends show up in a, a small uh, van, that's going to be okay. <laughs> And I highly recommend um, visiting some of these trees and, and talking to the people that care about them too. Um, so a little bit of history, I like to throw in I, I've got a treasure trove of, of um, old photographs around the big trees. Um, you know, I like to highlight that we do have the capability of growing champion sized trees here in Maine. Uh, we're not growing giant sequoias, um, but for the trees that we do grow, we, we grow them rather well. Um, Maine has had a history of, of many national champions. Um, we once had the national champion White Pine, um, and this particular tree stood in the town of Abbott. It was 147 feet tall. I've never had a, another White Pine that's graced the registry since this that's been that tall. That is an extraordinarily tall tree. Um, and this photo uh, indicates it was taken in 1971. Uh, when this tree came down in the 1970s, um, sorry, uh, a, a, a slab of it, a cookie we call it, um, was taken from the tree and actually uh, resides in the offices of the Piscataqua West County Soil and Water Conservation District. And they have all kinds of notes along on the, the giant tree cookie about what year, you know, certain um, markers were. You can, you can see patterns in weather. Um, hurricanes, 
you know, trees grow exceptionally well when they have a, a lot of rain. Um, and so you can see some of those indicators within the tree rings, which is really neat. Um, and this is just an old slide composite of uh, the national champions we had at one point. Um, we did have that white pine. We also had a pitch pine, um, a champion eastern larch or tamarack, uh, silver maple, um, which we, we have had some very large silver maple, but no, no national champions since that one. And then this amazing hop corn beam. Um, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with hawthorn beam. It's a, a smaller understory tree. It's one of our native trees. It has a little seed that looks like a hop. You know, if you're familiar with what they used to brew beer, um, it, it has a seed pod that looks like that. Um, I have one growing in the woods by my house. It's maybe like three or four inches. That's pretty typical. Might be 30 feet tall. This one had a circumference of 114 inches. It was 70 feet tall uh, and a crown spread of 57 feet. That, that is a, a good sized tree um, by any measure. Um, had a tall point value of 198. I don't think the one that we have on the list now is much more than 100 points. So it was roughly double the size. <clears throat> and I mean, how, how can you not love these garden club ladies? <laughs> Out measuring their tree. Um, <laughs> and I, I found out, <laughs> I was looking at this picture. When I first started measure, uh, managing the big tree registry, I worked at the, um, at the time, it was called the Pine Tree State Arboretum, the State Arboretum in Augusta. Um, that arboretum has since been renamed the Viles Arboretum. Um, if you have a chance to visit, absolutely should. They, they, they love birds there too. Um, the woman that is in the picture on the right hand side here, I thought, boy, she looks like one of the women that was on the board of directors when I worked at the Arboretum, and her name was Elsie Vile. Um, and I sent this picture just recently to her family, who still uh, are alive. Um, and they said, in fact, that that is Elsie Vile. Um, and <clears throat> the Arboretum, as I said, has been uh, renamed, um, and, and she was one of the benefactors, um, she and her husband. Um, that the Arboretum is named for. So I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, this is a, another former national champion, Eastern Larch. Um, it was located in the town of Jay. Um, and Fred Huntress is uh, the nominator of this tree. Fred is, a uh, uh, his name will appear frequently on the list. Um, he had a, a forestry career in Maine spanning over 50 years and he uh, prided himself on uh, being a big tree hunter. Uh, he passed away just last year. Um, his license plate was big tree. I didn't get to the DMV and, and you know, nab that uh, <laughs> before somebody else got it. But, um, but he, he was um, well known for having a, a proclivity for finding big trees. Um, so this was uh, just one of his many. <clears throat> And forgive me, I'm I'm kind of skipping over some of the uh, the wildlife values. Tamarack again is another uh, native tree, um, and I want to point out that it is a host plant for many of the sphinx moths and and bark beetles. So um, sometimes trees themselves are not the 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 providing the direct wildlife value to the birds, but it's the insects and, and such that are feeding on them. Um, so. The insects that feed on on tamarack uh, do provide a lot of habitat value. Let's see here. So, you know, you're here because you're interested in big trees. A lot of people like big trees. I've got a, a whole um, couple files full of uh, news pieces on big trees. Um, you know, this fellow in in China found a big balsam fir. Um, the uh, arborist that discovered a, a, a beautiful cucumber magnolia, which I actually have pictures of um, coming up in, in Brunswick. Um, terrible photo there, but that's a, a national champion white birch that we had. I wish I could have seen that tree. It's bigger than I've ever seen any white birch anywhere. <clears throat> Um, folks who just love their box elder. I mean, 
box elder is kind of a junk tree for most people, but they they love their box elder. Um, and, and they will be damned if anybody is going to beat that box elder today. <laughs> that, that tree's been on the list for a long time. <laughs> um, and that story is about the people who care for them. Of course, um, anybody who's been around for any amount of time um, certainly heard about um, Frank Knight and the town of Yarmouth and his care of their own trees. Um, and then, uh, you know, stories about historic landmarks, too. I've got pictures of this one. This is a European linden located in the town of Pittsburgh. And then um, the biggest tree, I, I don't have any more pictures of this one, but this was a, a, a over 400 points. Um, the only tree I've had over 400 points, it was a silver maple in the town of Leeds. Just a monster. Um, and that, I'm sorry? It, it has decomposed. It, you know, you can still see remnants of a, a lot of the trees that have fallen down. Um, they haven't been carted off or anything like that. So they're still providing a, a lot of wildlife value. Um, and they have, a, in many cases, have offspring that are, you know, nearing their size around them. So this is a great spot uh, along the Androscoggin where this silver maple is, and there's a pile of yellow birch there too. Silver maple is a really fast growing tree, so um, that one we wouldn't have estimated would be, you know, more than probably 150 years old. But that would be very old. So they do have a tendency to fall apart as they get older and bigger. And I, I, I like to um, say that trees as they get older, you know, particularly trees like silver maple. Um, yeah, I, 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 most of the hardwoods kind of give themselves a haircut as they get older. I had this aunt, Aunt Lil, she shrunk. She was she, she was 99, I think, by the time she passed away. But she, she was a tall woman, and she just shrunk over time. And I, trees kind of do the same thing. They're just kind of, they, they're keeping their, their um, you know, core function um, close to the heart uh, of sorts, um, and they shrink. So this silver maple, it never got taller, it never really got wider, but it did continue to have that burr. Um, and oftentimes with storms, it would lose a branch here and there, you know, it, and it would literally almost have a haircut um, until it finally came down. Um, but I did get to see it and I got to climb it too. <laughs> um, so a, a, a few others, um, and again, I'm going to try to focus on some natives or, or, or you know, some near natives. Um, this is a bur oak um, it's located in the town of Valsaboro. Uh, let's see. There, there, there are some neat stories associated with all of these trees. And, and this one, I think, is the only one that stands guard over a house that is very much reportedly a haunted house. <laughs> it's the old um oh, I can't remember what they call it but it's you know the old millworks owners home and it had the home changed uses many times over the years um it served as a, a doctor's office and it also served as an abortion clinic um very very early on when uh, that was not legal um and it now serves as, a, you know, apartments, and there's lots of various different people that live there. Um, but the owner of this home claims that this tree is a grounding uh, tree, that it's, its roots connected to the earth, that he does tours of the home occasionally. I've seen some of them, there's YouTube uh, videos of them. Um, he, when he does these tours, he always has his, his visitors start at the tree and kind of cleanse their energy by touching the tree mm -hmm. and then going into the house. And uh, like I said, they all see stuff. And he says that when people go in, they often leave the house running and they go back to the tree because it grounds them. It clears their energy. I, you know, take it for what you will. <laughs> it's a fun story, and there's lots of fun stories associated with the trees. Um, 
but uh, this Baroque, um, it's been um, one of the only Baroques that we've had on the list. Um, Baroque is a native tree. It's not a very common native tree. More often than not, I see it in cultural settings. Um, but there are some, some places where you do see Baroque in native settings, and uh, particularly around the Kennebec Valley um, in, in central Maine. Um, we, there's quite a few different areas where you see Baroque. Um, let's see. Um, and I, I will point out with all of the oaks, I mean, I think most of you in this room know the oaks are one of our most valuable wildlife species. Um, of course, the acorns provide food for a wide range of, of animals and birds. <clears throat> and then they also play host to a, a tremendous um, diversity of insect life to the, the supports wildlife. Here's that cucumber magnolia again that I highlighted in one of the, the newspaper articles. Um, this one's located in Brunswick. It has a circumference of 186 inches, height of 88 feet, crown spread of 79 feet, and 12 points of 294. Then a backyard, so not very easily accessible. Um, but it was discovered by an arborist who was called to do, do work on the tree. Not a very common landscape tree here in Maine at all. It is not native to Maine. It is, however, native to the Eastern United States. Um, it is one of the largest and most hardy of the magnolias, so it does grow well, um, certainly in this part of the state, um, as well as up into the mid coast and central part of the state. Um, and uh, it is a, a good candidate for ornamental planting if you're looking to plant a, a magnolia um, in your landscape. Um, it's not as showy as some of the smaller flowering magnolias, and, and because it is a large tree, generally those flowers are going to be way up high, um, but, but uh, it is a valuable species, um, and as we start to consider things like uh, assisting species that are more uh, acclimated to climates in southern New England, to northern New England, um, something that we call assisted migration, um, this would be something that you could consider uh, planting in your own landscape. This is a green app. Uh, it's in Portland. It's right downtown in the, the Rose Garden section of Deering Oaks uh, across from the post office. It has a circumference of 131 inches, a height of 97 feet, a crown spread of 69 feet, and a 12 point value of 245. So we have three species of ash that are native to Maine, the green ash, the brown or black ash, which is the species that's used by Native Americans for their basket making, and then the white ash. Uh, all three species are susceptible to um, the emerald ash borer. I'm sure you know, if you're, you're all here in this room, part of Audubon, um, you know, you're, you're paying attention to what's happening around um, uh, invasive species movement. Emerald ash borer is an insect that was uh, brought to this country on probably wooden pallets um, from other parts of the world and has spread from the original point of entry in the Great Lakes region uh, to most of the Eastern United States, some states out West, Canada, uh, and it is devastating all of our ash trees. And green ash is one of those. Um, ash are um, all very valuable species, um, both commercially as well as for wildlife purposes. Um, green ash and brown ash particularly are, are um, uh, wetland species. Um, they provide valuable cover and feed for numerous bird and animal species, um, and also host um, caterpillars of these follow tail butterflies in the polyphemus moth. Um, so losing a species like ash has ramifications for, for species down the line. Um, so you know, where we can, we're trying to preserve those. Um, in this case, um, because it's a city tree, the city of Portland has treated this tree with um, in, an injectable insecticide that's very targeted to the timing of that insect um, to be able to hopefully maintain this tree. 
Uh, this tree, you can turn around from the green ash and you're going to see the pin oak. Um, many of you probably know this tree. Uh, it's often referred to as the candelabra tree. Um, it has a circumference of 163 inches, 89 feet tall, and it has a crown spread of 160. Very widespread in branches. Um, there's a reason it's called the candelabra. Um, again, right across from the post office in that, that uh, rose garden section of Portland. Um, and many people know, to, know the tree, not just for the tree, but for the decorations that appear in it in um, the winter months. Um, Pandora Lacase, who does the, the beautiful um, orbs, uh, decorates this tree most years. I can't do a big tree presentation, even though Herbie's been gone for over 10 years. I got to talk about Herbie. Um, Herbie was New England's largest elm, um, has the whole story behind um, why the tree was named Herbie. It was uh, a little girl in the house next door. Um, that was her, her name for it. And when the arborist came to do some pruning to, to remove some of the Dutch elm disease infested limbs, she came running out of the house saying, no, 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 don't cut Herbie down. <laughs> and, and it stopped. <laughs> Um, so everybody knew um, this beautiful elm that was located on, on the corner of uh, that side street there in Route 88 as, as Herbie. Um, and when Herbie came down, uh, it was it was a pretty traumatic thing for me. <laughs> I, I worked with the town for over a year planning for how we were going to take that tree down and, and use it for good. Um, so when we... Uh, Cut the tree. Um, it, you know, it, I, I don't have a picture of I, I laid down on the stem of it. You know, it was seven, eight feet across. Um, and we we contracted with a, a sawmill to saw in it all different shapes and sizes so that things like these beautiful wooden bowls could be made. Um, musical instruments. I mean, they made they made. Uh, something from nearly every portion of that tree, um, including um, one lady took sawdust from the song and she put it in little bottles and called it Herbie's Ashes. <laughs> um, and uh, when Frank died, Frank was the caretaker of Herbie. Um, he, he loved that tree. When I started, um, this was probably one of the first big trees I went to measure. Uh, with Frank, who at the time, he'd already been the tree warden in Yarmouth for over 50 years. I think he was 92. And I let him drive me. He was perfectly <laughs> capable. Um, let him drive me. He said, I've got to take you in a, a certain way. So we came in kind of a back approach, not on the main road, to the tree. And he stopped, uh, you know, probably 100 yards away. And he leaned forward in the car and he just said, isn't he magnificent? <laughs> and he was. He was. Um, so, so one of the things um, that <clears throat> was made out of Herbie um, was a simple wooden shaker casket for Frank when he passed away, um, and he was buried. Um, so we've had other American elms on the list. I, I throw this one in there not because it's still standing either. Unfortunately, Dutch elm disease is still a very real thing. Um, and it still impacts our elms. Um, Castine has a, a tremendous number of elms still. As does the Hennepin Court, I highly recommend a visit to see the elms while they're still there. They still struggle to keep these elms alive. Um, this was a, a subsequent champion that has um, come down in the last, oh, probably six years ago. And I, I throw this in there, one, because some of you might recognize Laura Zitsky. She is the clever uh, queen at uh, Mills and Farms, um, and she used to work for me. So um, we've got another connection there. But this is a gorgeous tree. Um, and this is our champion now. This is a old fence row elm that's come up. As you can see, it's got multiple stems. It's, it's not the magnificent tree that, that Herbie was, but it's still quite, quite lovely. Um, it, it's 75 feet tall, so 
nowhere near the, the close to 100 feet that, that Herbie was. But um, Jen S., his, this tree's owner, uh, very much takes care of this tree as well. Um, and I, I anticipate that because of the prevalence of Dutch elm disease, I will see many more elm champions in my time and managing the Big Tree Register uh, for the years to come. And this is another one of our national champions. Uh, doesn't look like much, kind of a, a, a smaller stature tree, the black spruce. Um, has been a national champion since 2009. Uh, and it is publicly accessible. If you're ever down on the Blue Hill Peninsula, going to Castine, going to Deer Isle, I highly recommend taking a look at this tree as well. It's also in a bit of a fairyland. Um, it is located um, just off the road uh, that leads into the wooden boat school. And there is a trail that leads to so it. it is, and it's not very far into the woods. Um, this tree has a uh, two, just over two foot uh, diameter. Um, and I like to point out here that black spurs, while, you know, that silver maple I showed you was massive, over 400 points, um, fast growing. Black spruce is an extremely slow growing tree. Um, it is often associated with wetlands and bogs, and, and trees that grow in that situation often do grow quite slow because those are rather anaerobic conditions. Um, it is uh, one of the traditional sources for spruce gum, um, and, along with red spruce. Um, it can also be used to um, boil along with sugar for making spruce beer. Um, that was a, a common thing, uh, you know, ages ago. Spruce gum tastes disgusting, <laughs> but apparently very high in, in minerals. Um, and then also, uh, along with uh, many of the other conifers, the needles can be boiled in, in tea, and they're very high in uh, vitamin C. Um, that actually is, is rather tasty. Um, and then I've got the, the picture of the birch bark canoe here. I don't know how many people of you know this, but the strappings, um, so the, the ties around the edge, those are actually the roots of red or black spruce that are used to tie the, the, the canoes together. Um, uh, it, pretty fascinating how uh, birch bark canoes are made and, and completely natural. Um, So this one is not a native, um, as its name indicates, the European linden. This one's located in Pittsburgh um, at the 70, 1776 house and the 1776 church. And they are such named because that um, the, the house was built and it is thought that the tree was planted around that same time. There's a plaque on it, which you can't read here, but the plaque indicates um, when the tree was planted and who some of the notable folks are who are located in that cemetery there, one of which was the one of the first senators for the state um, as it gained statehood. Uh, his name was Mark Hill. Um, let's see. Yeah, Mark here. Um, yeah, and this tree, I believe, is the only tree that is on the register still that was nominated by Forest Commissioner Austin Wilkins when he um, when he started the list. Uh, a couple more pictures. Uh, Linden. Um, while again, this one is not a native tree. Lindens are highly known for their valuable. Um, uh, uh, flower um, sap and pollen. They're, they're extraordinarily fragrant and attractive to bees. Um, European linden would be the, the original bee tree um, that is located in Europe. We have native lindens as well. Um, the American basswood um, is a very close relative and a native um, to the uh, main. Um, that's what I'm highlighting here. <clears throat> So this beauty is located over in Waterford, um, has a massive trunk of 234 inches, 82 feet tall, and a crown spread of 74 feet for uh, 335 points. 
um, it's newer addition to the list, um, which uh, came on in 2012. Um, and I wanted to point this one out uh, because primarily one, it, it is a native tree and it's a, a lovely tree, um, not very common in the woods and certainly not very common in planted situations, but it, it is a great tree if you have a lot of space. Um, it has these beautiful heart-shaped leaves and it also has that, that same um, fragrant flower. Um, but uh, several county organizations actually run their own county big tree list. And this is one that became known to us because the Oxford County Soil and Water Conservation District runs their own list. And they feed a, a, just a pile of trees to me. Um, this being one of them, uh, that mountain paper birch that I referenced, I, didn't, I don't have any pictures of that one, but that is a, a national champion that they sent to me. Um, and, and I think this next one is as well. Um, this is the current state champion East, Eastern White Pine. I have nominated it to the National Register as well. Um, it's located um, back in the woods on a woodlot in Sumner. Uh, it has a massive circumference of 244 inches, not feet. <laughs> um, and, and you can see why. It's it's what we would call a, a wolf tree or a field pine. Um, it's got all of these branches that have kind of grown up and together. And so you can't get through the center of that to kind of figure out where the, where the original one tree is. Um, I have no projections on how old this tree is, um, but it's it's a favorite of, of the owners. And um, right now that's our champion. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, the other champion white pines that we've had uh, have also fallen apart. We had one that was a national champion in uh, the town of Morrill. It had been hit by snow plows. It was so close to the road and it finally, um, it, it split apart. It had a double stem. Um, it split apart and became dangerous. And then we had another beautiful one um, that was a single stem uh, in the town of Norwich Park in a, a little park um, called Ashley Wing Memorial Park. It's still there, but they had a big arm off to the side of it and that peeled off just this last winter. So, <laughs> these storms we've been having have not done any favors to our big trees. <laughs> This one being another case in point. If you know of any big red oaks, please send them my way. Um, I had co-champion red oaks. Uh, this one's in Augusta, um, very nearby to the historic um, Kennebec Arsenal. Uh, it had a circumference of 242 inches, 90 feet tall, and had a crown spread of 89 feet um, for total points of 354. It lost that arm that's pointing towards us um, this this last winter. Um, so it's still standing, um, but it is a little bit diminished uh, in size. Um, and then its sister on the list, um, this gorgeous red oak and level, um, stood right on the corner um, and was the, the you know joy of, a, of the owners. Unfortunately, a um, couple of different things happened in the last two to three years. In Western Maine, we've had a very um, strong upsurge in the spongy moth occurrence. Many of you probably know that as uh, gypsy moth. So gypsy moth um, it had a, a bit of a, a wave. Um, so it had um, fed you know, on this tree um, and diminished its resources. And then last spring, we had a very late frost in certain parts of the state. And I think you guys were, were pretty hard hit here. Um, between that spongy moth damage and that late frost, it had one green twig on it last summer. And I'm, I'm waiting to see if maybe it, it it has enough carbohydrates stored up that it puts out a new flush of leaves this spring. Cross your fingers. Um, it, it's a beauty. Um, and it would be worth going to look at it, even if it doesn't have leaves on it. It's, it's so grand. Um, 
but yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of hard things for trees. I kept this one in because everybody goes to O'Donnell's shopping, um, you know, looking at the gardens. This one's right in their display gardens. It's a bald cypress, not native to Maine, um, but it grows well here. And um, Jeff O'Donnell pictured there with his dog. He, he no longer um, runs the, the nursery, but, you know, he was willing to try all sorts of different things. And this was one of them. Um, and you can't see it in the pictures, but it actually um, a few years ago when I, I took these photos, it was starting to get those those knees. Um, if you're familiar with bald cypress, it grows in swamps in, in the southern part of the United States, and it forms these knees that are uh, essentially a, a mechanism for the tree to access oxygen. And so, and so it, it had started to form some of these knees. Um, very neat tree. It's um, one of the few deciduous conifers in the United States. I should have mentioned earlier uh, when I talked about the tamarack, the tamarack is the only native deciduous conifer that we have that grows in, the United, uh, in uh, Maine. Um, running up on time here, so I'm going to probably go quickly through a few of these. I've got a couple of red pine on the list, um, very close in size. Uh, and I, I highlight this one because it is at Mount Blue State Park, uh, very accessible. It's right on the, um, the trail that leads to the, the beach. Um, so if you're at Mount Blue, I, I encourage you to check it out. Gorgeous bark, absolutely beautiful bark when you get up close to it. And the pictures don't do it justice. Um, <clears throat> And then it has a, a sister on the list, um, which is located in the woods of uh, a wonderful tree farm in Norwich Walk. Um, and I, I like to share this one because some trees, some people are just really good at growing big trees. This one farm in Norwich Walk has, I think, close to half a dozen big trees uh, on the farm. And this is a, a not one that they've grown, it's it's natural there, um, but uh, just just uh, a, a beautiful, tall, straight red pond. Um, and this one also on the same farm, the Quaking Aspen, um, probably won't be there for a whole lot of time. Quaking Aspen's a very short-lived tree, um, but is the champion for now. This, Red spruce is one of my personal favorites. Um, red spruce is um, uh, an important species, uh, both economically as well as environmentally here in the state of Maine. Um, it is uh, one of the most valuable commercial species for pulp um, and old red spruce particularly um, is also highly valued for its resonance qualities and musical instrument music. Um, from a wildlife perspective, red squirrels love red spruce, <laughs> um, as do voles, um, spruce grouse, and um, several different varieties of birds. Um, Martin, snowshoe hare, and lynx also uh, heavily rely on the spruce fir forest type um, as uh, cover for them. Um, this one is in. Uh, Moosehead Junction Township. It's located on the um, Little Moose unit of the state public lands. If you do any hiking, it's out there. It's hard to find. It took me three trips to find it, and I had GPS. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's located in a spot that was um, brought to my attention by one of our psychologists. And um, they do uh, long term monitoring on certain plots of land on our state public lands. And this is one of those long-term monitoring plots. So these are, are demarcated so that they're, they're you know, studied essentially in per perpetuity. They're not logged. Um, the trees that are located in this particular little spot are um, have been documented to be over 300 years old. So uh, red spruce, along with black spruce, is another one of those really slow-growing species that can attain a uh, very long age. Um, uh, this one I mentioned, because it's located in the town of York, you're probably familiar with the historic cemetery there. 
um, sassafras, it, we're at the northern end of its range here, um, but there are many, many specimens that are located in that cemetery. Um, it, it's a really neat tree. Um, if you don't know it, it has three different leaf types as if identifying trees isn't hard enough. This one tree has three different shaped leaves. <laughs> and sometimes they can all be on the same tree. <laughs> um, but we're checking it out. Um, Black locust, I, I only wanted to point this one out because it is the only specimen right now that I have on the list um, or that will be on the list going forward that is classified as um, invasive. Um, and it, it's, I, I'm, I'm struggling with it. So maybe you can help <laughs> to not struggle so much. It is native to the United States. Um, it is planted or has been planted historically in all 50 states. Um, but it is classified as invasive. It is, it is very aggressive and the places where it, it grows, it does spread um, and it can be an incredible nuisance. Um, but this tree is extraordinary. Um, so I, I am struggling a little bit with, with taking it off um, and um, not just because it's a beautiful tree, um, but it, its flowers do have pretty pretty um, high habitat value um, for pollinators. Um, they're intoxicating to smell. Um, it, it doesn't have many other redeeming qualities <laughs> if it's not cared for. Um, but that I, I did, just want to point that out. A um, few more that are here locally, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, this one's in Limerick, uh, uh, Black Walnut. Again, not native, um, but widely planted and not uh, invasive. Um, has a circumference of 166 inches, 99 feet tall, um, 66 foot crown spread. And this one has a great story. Uh, it's located at what's called Walnut Grove Farm, um, named after the walnuts planted there. Um, and according to the owners, um, Bart and Stephanie Knight, um, the, the home has been in the same family for multiple generations. I mean, the, 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 that is the original family um, that still owns this farm. Um, and according to, to Bart, um, the seeds of the black walnut were sent to his great grandmother during the Civil War from her brothers who were off in the southern part of the United States fighting. They sent her black walnuts to eat. She planted them. <laughs> and, and that's, um, you know, what's that? It is a little too close to them. And, and I will say um, they have been meticulously restoring this home and, and taking great care to take care of that tree. Um, there's a rod in it holding the tree together. That rod dates to 1924 when the tree was struck, struck by lightning. Um, and it's it's hard to see, but the walnuts just have this gorgeous lacy foliage. Um, it, really pretty, and you can see in in the photos um, it, it, the trees have obviously spread. And the squirrels do a, a pretty good job of um, planting them out um, all throughout the farm. You can't. Uh, Talk about big trees in Maine, and I'll talk about a sugar maple, um, you know, one of our most magnificent trees for fall color. Um, this one's located in the town of Whitefield. Um, it's been on the list for a number of years, um, 322 points. Um, and again, very well cared for on an old, old farm, um, you know, off of one lane dirt road. Um, yellow poplar. Another one like cucumber magnolia that I would consider um, <clears throat> an up and coming native, if you will, uh, grows in southern New England um, and other other uh, you know deciduous forest types, um, but has been commonly planted in cultural landscapes in Maine. Um, this is the tallest tree that we have on the list at 142 feet tall. Um, towers over that house. Um, a little frighteningly, quite frankly. <laughs> um, a lot of people know yellow poplar um, or, or tulip tree is another name for it um, as being kind of a, a, a brittle tree. Um, 
not popular at all. Um, but um, in the case of this tree and the cucumber magnolia in Brunswick, both of these homes are old ship captains' homes. And the stories, I think, for both of them were that the ship captains that, that lived in those homes, they had a bride from somewhere, you know, south of here. And in order to make their bride feel comfortable being in the cold climate of Maine, they brought something from their homes um, and they planted these southern um, southern species. Um, this is uh, just an outstanding specimen. Another one that was brought to me by the, um, the ecologist at the Maine Natural Areas Program. Swamp white oak is native to Maine, but it's very rare. Um, this is one of only a few native occurrences of swamp white oak. Um, and it's the only native occurrence of swamp white oak that I've ever had on this big tree register. Every other swamp white oak we've had on the register has been uh, one that's been in a cultural landscape where it's been planted. Um, uh, as its name indicates, grows in swamps. Um, and this is no exception. That was a dry day when we went to measure that, and I'm pretty sure I had hip waders on. <laughs> um, pretty messy, but um, just a really neat tree. Um, and again, as with all the oaks, you know, tremendous wildlife value um, in places where swamp white oak grows. Um, it's been shown to be a very valuable food source, particularly to wild ducks, where it can make up to a quarter of their, their um, food. Eastern hemlock, um, one of our, I think, probably the, the longest lived tree uh, native to Maine. Um, this one's located in Dover Foxcroft at Peace Penny State Park. If you do any camping or you, you want to get out and see our state parks, um, this one's located in the campground. Um, 140 inches around, 105 feet tall, a uh, crown spread of 53 feet. Um, and being a, one of our, our longest lived species, um, I, I, it's hard to say that this one is um, necessarily older than other specimens on the list, but hemlock can grow, to, uh, it, can, it can live up to 800 years. Um, I believe this one, um, is, is thought to be around 200 years old. Um, and, and again, it's another one that's threatened by multiple different um, invasive species. You've got hemlock really adelgid here, the elongate hemlock scale, um, all of these things threaten this incredibly valuable wildlife species. <clears throat> um, hemlock is not traditionally that commercially valuable. It is extraordinarily valuable to particularly stream habitat um, for, for uh, migrating birds as well as for uh, brook trout and keeping streams cool. Um, so it, it would be a real shame if we lose hemlock. Um, and as our climate changes, we're, we're seeing many of these insects also move further into Maine. Uh, you know, when I first started in this field, it was thought that hemlock woolly adelgid was really only going to be a problem on the coast and in Southern County. And now we're finding it in uh, Kennebec County, I think just south, south of Augusta. So it's thought that it could even spread as far as Canada, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to skip this one um, because I want to show Becky's tree. <laughs> Becky Rooney is in the audience here, um, and I've got two trees that I'm going to uh, round out the presentation um, with. They're co-champions, or will be co-champions, I believe, um, in the 2024 list. This is a white ash located in, in uh, Becky Rooney's uh, um, home and uh, former nursery, right, in uh, York slash Cape Nettick. I've never quite is Cape Natick its own town? No. Okay. <laughs> so in New York. Um, and I had the pleasure of, of meeting with Becky and her arborist, Steve Brooke, and measuring the tree. Oh, I, was it just in January, Becky? Yeah. Um, 248 inch, inches around, 79 feet tall, and on a crown spread of 103 feet. Not the crown spread on this one. 
Um, and uh, I, I, it's, it's always a joy to me to see somebody like Becky who has cared for a tree um, for so long to, to be recognized for that care. And then part of that recognition, it was for her, um, her husband, David, as well, because um, he took care of this tree and, and the, the land around it um, for many, many decades. Um, so this is going to be one of our, our new co-champions. Um, and it also is kind of astounding to me that I can crown a new co-champion in 2024 with the only tree that has been on the list from its inception. This tree has been on the State Big Tree Registry since 1968. It's a white ash. So, so Becky's tree is, is going to be listed as a co-champion with this white ash located in the waterfront. Um, at its last measurement, 251 inches around, so pretty close around, um, 70 feet tall, I think not quite as tall, and with half the crown spread of, of Becky's tree um, for a total of points of 334. So it's a little bit si smaller size wise, but um, I didn't explain it earlier. If, if the trees are less than, I think, 3% in points different. That's what determines whether they're, they're co-champions or not. So these two will be listed as co-champions if this one's still standing. I visit it frequently, um, and I haven't, it hasn't been a terribly long time since I visited it. This photo was taken, uh, I think, about 1970 um, with a fellow who's now a retired forester who used to work for us. Um, and this is a more recent photo. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a character tree. <laughs> uh, it's, it's got all kinds of character. Um, you know, many of those branches that, that contributed to its spread when it was nominated in 1968 have fallen. Um, it's got big gaping holes where porcupines make their home and, um, you know, lots of dead branches. Um, but it's still standing there. And, you know, the forest has all grown up around it. Um, and it also is the joy of, of its owner too. She can't take nearly as good care of it um, being out in the woods. Um, and it hasn't been treated, as I mentioned, um, treating trees from the Emerald Ash Borer. That's one of the things that, um, you know, gives me some comfort that the tree that at um, Becky Lenny's place has been treated. And I know that it's gonna be able to survive um, the onslaught of the Emerald Ash Borer. This tree, unfortunately, is too old um, to probably be able to take the insecticide that is used for that. It has to have enough, um, uh, yeah, circulation mechanism in the springtime to be able to pull all of that carbohydrate out of the soil and pull the, the chemical up with it to reach up into the leaves. And if you don't have a really good um, sunny day where a tree is pulling a lot of water, um, up, it won't take up that chemical. Um, so it, it very likely will um, succumb to age and to emerald ash borer um, in the coming years um, as, as emerald ash borer is located uh, very nearby to water from as well. But I'm going to finish there. Um, that's my last slide. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to keep in touch if you're interested in getting a copy of the 2020. 24 register when it comes out. I can send you printed copies, um, can send them to, to share at future programs. And we also put everything up on our, our website too. And I appreciate your, your attention and your interest. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Right, yeah, we we don't only because some of the trees are on private property and I can share that information along with how to contact owners if you wish to ask for permission in most cases. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons that I also point out the articles that I write monthly, because I do often mention things like, you know, the owners are, are happy to take you on a tour, or you can publicly view this particular tree from the right of way or what have you. Um, so you can contact me directly. Uh, in the future, as, as we become more advanced on our website, hopefully, um, trees that are on public in public spaces, I will advertise those locations. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I absolutely do understand that sensitivity around that. Um I have been a pretty careful guardian of, of private tree information. And when I know that we have a private landowner who does not want the public to visit, I I keep those notes in my database and I don't share that information. Um, or I just I will say, you know, here's the owner's name and give them a telephone number. And if they want to call, they can call. It is, a, you know, a state resource. So technically the information is public. Um, I have not had any trees vandalized. No, I have heard of that happening in other places. Um, as, hmm? In other states, yeah. And the only cases I've, I'm aware of where, you know, trees have been cut down inadvertently is just because somebody didn't know. In fact, the, the, um, it was a relatively new addition to the list. I had an American beach that was located on Long Island in Casco Bay and Central Maine Power cut it down just like last week. <laughs> Yeah, he's asking if there's reluctance to take the core sample, like the increment board. And yes, absolutely. I do not put a hole in a tree if I don't need to. Um, I do have access to one other tool that, that makes a much smaller hole. Um, it's like a tenth of an inch diameter drill bit, and it, it goes in longer, and it doesn't pull the the core out, it actually gives me a, a graphical reading of the um, density. And so with you, with the density, you can see the, the difference between the winter wood and the summer wood, and that gives you the, um, can give you, again, if it is not wrong. I don't. <laughs> I, can, I have to borrow it when, you know, signing my life on the line from the U.S. Forest Service. But I can I can use it on people's trees. So if you have an interest in knowing an age, um, you can ask me to get the tool, and I can come out and, and take a measurement. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, right here in the front. Have but the question is, um, in, in my travels, have I come across American chestnuts growing out in the woods? And yes, I am not typically the one that's discovering them, but there are people that are very um, keenly looking for a, a reproductive American chestnut. Um, we have a whole American Chestnut Foundation, and that's one of the things that they do is locate um, natural stands of chestnut that are, are breeding. Um, I did get, uh, there have been a couple of stories over the last 10 years about um, a couple of different chestnuts in Maine. One of them was, I believe, the tallest American chestnut that had been found in the country. It, not obviously historically, but today. Um, and I did get notice um, just recently that that tree maybe has succumbed to the disease. Um, but there are others and there are some known places um, where there are actually stands of them. One of my favorite spots is in Atkinson, Maine. Um, 
uh, between Charleston and Dover Foxcroft, there's a, a fairly large stand of American chestnut. They're not old, but they are breeding. And they're, they're a really neat tree. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the question is, um, if I could say a little bit more about how I uh, physically measure the height and the width of trees. Um, so the height is probably the most complicated measurement. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to show you my tool. Um, it, it's if you can envision, uh, essentially, it's kind of a protractor inside of this little um, uh, gadget that you line up one eye with, and you have to keep both your eyes open. And that's a little difficult for some people. Um, but you line up the top of the tree. So you got to be able to see the top of the tree, which in the woods can sometimes be difficult too. Um, but as if, if I, I or I have to do some complicated math. Um, both are possible. I'd rather not do the complicated math. Um, but you line it up and it, with the protractor, it will tell you based on 100 feet away how tall the tree is. I also have a laser um, and the laser is much uh, quicker. It's got all of that information calibrated in there. I can be any distance from the tree and it will calibrate how tall it is based on the angle. Um, but again, I have to be able to see the top of the tree. I only use the laser when I'm in a very, pretty much a wide open space. Um, the width of a tree is, is quite simple. In fact, um, I have this 100 foot tape. I give, I tell Bill where to stand on one side, <laughs> hold the tape and I, I go across and I measure, you know, again, that drip edge, if you can imagine the, the crown being an umbrella. And then we do that um, in two different planes. Question back here. Uh, so she's asking if uh, anybody had told me about the wolf pine that is on the one of the trails here at the on the musky trail. Nobody has mentioned it. No, and it's, <laughs> it's a little dark right now. But you know, had I gotten here earlier, I, I was going to actually take a, a longer walk. Um, yeah, you know, I'm surprised too because I, I have in, in not big tree terms, but in my regular work um, in urban forestry, I've done a lot of work with the, the reserve on the Yankee Woods lot. Um, so I, I'm somewhat familiar with the, the grounds over there. Um, but no, nobody's mentioned that. So I'll, another trip. <laughs> I'll do that. And one more bill? Sure. Okay, yeah, I think we can press stop here. Are you doing any uh, formulas for calculating, for, for calculating the age of the tree by using yeah. it for something uh, seen one where you have to see the tree down so that you can measure it? Then there's a, they have a little constant application. Yeah, the question's about um, uh, calculating the age um, using a formula for specific species of trees. And yes, I have seen that. I've never, never practiced using it myself. But I think um, in a, to, to have it, I mean, I, 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 there's going to be a you know, certain deviation uh, using any formula like, like that. But, um, you know, that's relying on a, a certain set of growing conditions. Um, and for some species, <laughs> well, I, I, again, if it, if it in the right conditions, it would work. But I have, you know, I've seen 
you know, we, we've got a little toolbox we take out to do educational programs with kids and where we talk about the ages and we have different size tree cookies and you've got a hemlock, you know, that maybe this, this, uh, you know, wide across, and then you've got a hemlock that's this wide across and this one's a hundred years and this one's 40. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, some trees just don't make any sense. A pine tree can be like that. And if, you know, pine tree is probably one of the best examples of a tree that grown in the right conditions will grow at a fairly steady, even pace. Um, but you take it out of those conditions that's gonna grow much more slowly. It's gonna survive, but it's gonna grow much more slowly. So I, I don't put any stock in those parts. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't even remember what the time frame was. Are they still to spend it? You're very probably, um, you wonder a lot of times, we have a contender.